Most people would never think about doing wildlife photography on a day like today. The barometer's falling, weather's coming in, snow falling. Most people like the butter light. They like that rich, warm, silky light that comes with the end of a perfectly sunny day or a partly cloudy day early in the morning. Check out this warm butter light. See what I mean? But look at the drama in these images. I like it when the barometer's falling, wildlife are up on their feet, moving, looking for a good place to hunker down or looking for food, looking for emergency cover. I like to be out there when the adventure's happening. To get great images on a day like today, you have to meet the wildlife halfway there. You have to understand camera exposure, understand the theory behind how to make the pictures when the lights kind of screw you. Bruce Leventhal and I have been photographing together since 1992. We've learned a lot along the way. Join us on this little adventure as we show you some big ideas about how to photograph when the barometer is falling. Pool is so small. I don't think I've seen the pool this small before. With the trees in the background. I think I'm just going to get real low. One thing that I like to do is to actually lay down on the ice. It creates a three-dimensional sort of pop for the animal. They might disappear in the mist when I'm this low, but worth giving it a try. We're getting a nice snowfall, and that's adding drama to the shots. So we're kind of working in mist, uh, freezing cold temperatures below zero, and uh, light snowfall. So one of the things that I've learned about photographing swans over the years is you've got to stay home with a bird because you'll get five or six of them bathing at the same time and if you're you know, trying to keep track of them all and you're moving the, the camera following the bird that's rousing, then the one that you've been following has um, will then rouse when, when you're on the wrong bird and then the next thing you know you'll be out of focus on one bird and struggling to get to another bird. So. Uh, what, I've, what I've discovered is if I find a bird that I like, I think it's pretty, it's got some white color, a uh, rusty neck, or a really nice black beak, I'm going to stick with it. But the price for sticking with it is that you're going to expose your hands to the elements for a really long time because that bird's going to possibly do this for five minutes and uh, you're waiting for about a 10 second burst. But it's totally worth it. But now I've got my hands in my uh, Snuggie here trying to get some circulation back. So this, this landscape that we're working in here has a latitude of, what would you say, about almost three stops? From, yeah, so you're going from snow and ice to the dark um, background of the trees and when swans are flying across this stuff, what happens very often if you're shooting an aperture priority um, is that your camera's going to swiftly try to acquire perfect exposure on the trees and then your swans are going to be blown out and blurry. So today, my strategy was in anticipation of perhaps swans flying was to find juvenile swans that have some gray. They're like a gray card, they're 18% gray, and get them just about right, and then hold it on uh, manual exposure. So I, di I was dialed in today at uh, ISO 400, F5.6, and 1 500th of a second. 
and I just kept it because the, the conditions were not changing a whole lot. A couple of my shots look a little muddy, some of them are a little bright, but for the most part I, I feel like I, I kept kept what I needed and so when they did that burst and they flew into the snowflakes I was able to freeze the action and also hold the exposure. Yeah so I went with a different strategy. I, um, I was working in auto ISO because I was emphasizing trying to get a high shutter speed so I was at all the way up to ISO 1600 in some spots and as low as ISO 400 in other spots and the thing was by um, being in auto ISO, I had I had my swans perfectly exposed when they were um, working, uh, rousing in the in the pool. But as soon as they took off and flew, um, I wasn't paying attention and didn't change my exposure compensation. And so when they went against the um, pines, which are really dark, um, my swan flew out. So the second time they flew, I I made sure that I was paying attention and um, adjusting my exposure compensation. And so I found that I would go from plus one stop when they were uh, in the water to as much as minus two thirds of a stop when they were flying against the pines. It's time for, time for some coffee. <laughs> So I am trying to get a, a composition that's pleasing and represents the place. Catch a little bit of that snow coming down. Uh, I'm looking to add some elements to the shot. So I'm, I'm fighting twigs and yet want the, the tree in the background as well so that I'm not backed by just uh, gray sky so that there's something here some other element that I can play with also think about what the picture is going to look like at the end so I've already got it in my head kind of a, the image I'm looking for a little bit of activity some eye contact and maybe even some way to do something with the sky The big issue here is how do you isolate the bird and yet uh, maintain some, some sense of the environment and not lose it because there's so much white everywhere. So uh, my brain's in the post-process mode, so I saw that there was so much detail there that I'd be able to um, pull some, some of the detail out of the eyes and be able to uh, uh, build something from that background, even though it looks gray, I think there's more to it than just the gray. Get yourself some good used gear, get out there and have an adventure.
Thank you.